Stand up, all victims of oppression, for the tyrants fear your might. Don't cling so hard to your possessions, for you have nothing if you have no rights. Let racist ignorance be ended, for respect makes the empires fall. Freedom is merely privilege extended and less enjoyed by one and all. So come, brothers and sisters, for the struggle carries on. The international unites the world in song. So comrades, come rally, for this is the time. If you're someone who considers themselves on the political left, communist, anarchist, or even social democrat, then you've probably, in one way or another, come across the hymn known as the Internationale. This masterpiece is one of the most widely translated and adapted ballads in the world, sung in over 115 languages in a spirit of global working class solidarity. Despite its contentious history and attacks from the right, the Internationale remains the de facto anthem of the global socialist movement to this day, and continues to communicate the same message of international unity in the global struggle waged by the toiling masses of the earth. The Internationale was written by an anarchist poet named Eugene Potier during an extraordinary turbulent period in France's history. The French Revolution gave rise to an emerging bourgeois class who took the revolutionary slogan of freedom, equality, and fraternity and applied it exclusively to themselves, the propertied class, keen on exploiting workers like Poitiers. Like many workers of the 19th century French proletariat, Poitier was active in the milieu of radical working class politics. At the age of 14, he witnessed the insurrection of 1830, which cost the lives of 1,800 revolutionaries, and in 1848, he participated in the establishment of the Second Republic. After Louis Bonaparte made himself emperor in 1851, Poitiers poured his anger and outrage into his poem entitled, Who Will Revenge This? His response came in 1870, when the Parisian masses rose up and overthrew Louis Bonaparte, and established the Paris Commune. Potier, a favored poet among the workers, served on the Public Services Commission of the Commune and held a seat on the Communal Council after a 93% share of the vote. The Paris Commune is widely regarded as the first successful example of the proletarian class ousting its oppressor and establishing a dictatorship of labor. Marx and Engels celebrated the success of the Paris Commune and drew great lessons from its achievements. However, they were also critical of the anti-statist anarchist tendencies within the Commune, including those of Potier himself. Marx and Engels knew that without seizing the state, the revolution would only remain temporary as the state would simply be left open and reorganized by the bourgeois class. 72 days after the establishment of the Commune, the bourgeoisie had done just that. The French army soldiers were sent to Paris, and massacred the communards in what became known as Bloody Week. The Paris Commune was dismantled, but its history and tradition continue to inspire future generations of revolutionary proletarians to continue the fight for freedom, equality, and fraternity. The Internationale is perhaps the most significant aspect of the Paris Commune that continues to live in the revolutionary struggles of the contemporary world. The longevity of Poitiers' Internationale, as highlighted by Donny Gluckstein, lies in the fact that Poitiers was able to encapsulate his personal experience of a specific event but express it in universal terms. The Paris Commune was formed on the heels of the Franco-Prussian War, which saw the humiliating defeat of France, Prussian invasion of the capital, as well as widespread hunger, poverty, and exploitation among the French working class. Parisian workers were forced into such destitution that they were reduced to eating house pets, 
zoo animals, and eventually even street rats. The opening lines of the Internationale were inspired by these horrifying events, calling on the prisoners of starvation to rise up. But these lyrics also struck a chord with a larger, more general sentiment towards capitalism among workers beyond the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune was established during a period where workers were also starving for literacy. At the start of the revolution in 1789, only 40 to 50 percent of the French population could adequately read and write. By the establishment of the Paris Commune, literacy reached roughly 70 percent, and by the early 20th century, virtually all French workers were literate. Working class intellectuals understood the importance of literacy, not only for the sake of communication, but for the sake of building individual autonomy among the workers. Literacy would allow the workers to become the masters of their own lives by enriching them with education, culture, history, and so on. This central task of the Paris Commune is reflected in the lyrics of the Internationale challenging the authority of the church by doing away with superstition. The communards understood that without their own enlightenment, the workers would continue to fall under the sway and influence of the Catholic Church, which held a great deal of power over the shape of marriage, family life, public education, and community solidarity. But through literacy and enlightenment, reason would replace superstition and allow working people to take control over their own fate. Poitiers' original version of the Internationale was intended to be sung to the tune of La Marseillaise, but in 1864, the Belgian socialist and member of the First International, Pierre de Gieser, recomposed the melody to appeal to a working-class audience beyond France. Gieser's version was produced as the anthem of the International Working Man's Association, which helped further embed the song deep within the socialist tradition. Gieser neglected to copyright the ballad, but as it slowly became more popular, his brother claimed it, and began to collect royalties. Pierre attempted to sue his brother in court, but he could not prove his authorship over the piece and was up against political forces larger than himself. He ended up losing the case and was forced to helplessly stand by and watch his brother collect royalties on his gift to the working class. However, during World War I, his brother hanged himself and left a suicide note confessing to the fraud and gave attribution to Pierre which was enough evidence to reverse the court's ruling in 1922 and once again give the song back to the workers of the world. The lyrics of the Internationale were translated into Russian in 1902, and in 1918, shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution, an adapted version of the song was made into the official anthem of the United Soviet Socialist Republics. The most notable revisions made by the Bolshevik rendition were in the use of language regarding the past and future tense. This was significant for how the song was now sung. Unlike previous versions which sang from below, the Soviet version was sung from above, from a position of actualizing the Internationale's call for revolution. It was no longer a call to begin waging a struggle, but a call to join those who were already making progress in the movement towards a socialist future. The USSR greatly elevated the status of the Internationale from a protest song to a national anthem, and with this newfound status came to symbolize a material threat to the capitalist West. In the United Kingdom, for example, the BBC held a popular weekly evening radio broadcast that played the national anthems of each country that Nazi Germany invaded. But in 1941, with the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union through Operation Barbarossa, many Brits were surprised to find that the BBC refused to play the Internationale. Winston Churchill, a staunch opponent of communism, immediately sent the word to the BBC that the Prime Minister has issued an instruction to the Ministry of Information that the Internationale is on no account to be played by the BBC. However, as the Soviet Union became Britain's strongest ally in the fight against the Nazis, Churchill was forced to put his anti-communism aside. He allowed the Internationale to be played in public, although the radio program was disbanded, preventing it from being played on the radio. Meanwhile, Stalin also attempted to appeal to the Allies by toning down the internationalist rhetoric of the Soviet Union. He not only removed the Internationale as the official anthem of the Soviet Union, 
but also dismantled the Third International created by Lenin in 1919, demonstrating for some a further pivot towards socialism in one country and the abandonment of proletarian internationalism. However, the state anthem of the USSR, which would come to replace the Internationale, expressed similar sentiments in the lyrics and even had a similar melody, thereby paying homage to the tradition from which it emerged. In China, Hu Chu Bai revised the translation of the lyrics into Chinese after having attended the fourth conference of the Comintern in 1921. Having not been able to join in the spontaneous singing of the Internationale by conference attendees with their own Chinese rendition, in 1923 he translated the lyrics from the original French into Chinese. Hu was responsible for early propaganda work of the Chinese Communist Party, and in 1927, he became acting chairman of the CCP Politburo and the de facto leader of the party. But in 1930, after being dismissed as Chinese Communist Party representative in Russia, Hu returned to China only to be also dismissed from the central leadership. Both of these dismissals were due to an intense argument over how the revolution should be carried out. When the Red Army began the famous Long March, Hu stayed in the south to lead the bushfighting. He was arrested in 1934 and sentenced to death by the Kuomintang a year later. Despite being tortured, he was persistent in his beliefs and refused to comply with their questioning. On the 18th of June, 1935, Hu walked calmly towards the execution palace, singing the Internationale and shouting Communist Party slogans. He was only 36 years old when he was shot dead by the Kuomintang regime. During the Mao era, a public radio broadcast concluded its daily show by playing the Internationale, which made the song a household name to every Chinese wealthy enough to own a radio. From this period onward, the Internationale could be found in many political histories of the People's Republic of China and has maintained its status as a de facto CCP anthem. The song continues to be popular with 21st century Chinese audiences today, as exemplified by its enthusiastic reception when sung at cultural events. Liu Huan, a Chinese artist and musicologist, is known across China for his style of combining Western pop influence with classical music. His rendition of the Internationale has become widely popular among Chinese audiences by fitting this old classic into the mold of contemporary taste. In his 2019 performance, he maintains the socialist spirit of the Internationale, not only in the content of the lyrics, but in the form of the delivery. Different genres of music form the building blocks of the rendition. It begins with one vocalist, but builds into several, and then at the end, the whole crowd is invited to join in. And since so many are familiar with the lyrics in China, many do. His rendition, therefore, ties the past with the present, the old with the young, and relays the relevancy of the tradition and spirit of the Internationale to a contemporary audience. Everything about the Internationale is so different from what we are used to listening to in the capitalist West. Western music is individualistic, whereas the Internationale is about the struggle of the global proletariat. Western music is sung individually, by individual performers, or in the privacy of the shower or your car. The Internationale is meant to be sung together. That's why there's 115 versions all sung in different languages. Furthermore, capitalist music is a commodity. It is produced to become intellectual property and sold as an exchange value. But the Internationale is not copywritten. It belongs to no individual, but to the international working class as a whole. With that, here is Liu Hu Wan's 2019 rendition of the Internationale, my personal favorite. Enjoy. Pour l'éternité là 
าเทศเพื่อผู้ de la fin La raison donne dans son cratère, c'est l'éruption de la fin du passé. Fait son table rase, faut l'esclave debout, debout. Le Va changer de place. Nous ne sommes rien, soyons doux. C'est la lutte finale. Groupons-nous et demain, l'intervention. Le genre humain, c'est la lutte finale. Roubons-nous et demain l'international sera le genre. She lied, she hung up for the lonely. She lied, the world is so cruel. Oh, oh, oh. 